As we all know, our airspace is increasingly complex and crowded. Prohibitive airspace is a constant safety and security consideration around many areas and regions of the world. Our final panel of the forum will de delve into this most timely topic, and we'll do so with two moderators this time. Captain Steve Jangelis is our Aviation Safety Chair, and Captain Wolfgang Koch is our Aviation Security Chair. Coincidentally, they both fly the A320 for Delta Airlines. Gentlemen, it's all yours. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for sticking around. I know it's late in the day. You all have been participating in a fatigue study. Thank you for your participation. Uh, we definitely uh, wanted to make sure that we save the best for last. I think we've got a really good panel here on uh, uh, a, a rising risk to our, our airspace system, uh, airspace closures and prohibited airspace and how they pop up and, and how we're starting to see some safety risks uh, be degraded or safety issues be degraded uh, there in the NAS on both sides of the border, US and Canada. Uh, again, I am Steve Jangelis, the Aviation Safety Chair. And on behalf of my co-moderator, Wolf Captain Wolfgang Koch, welcome to this afternoon's panel. Once again, painting the corners, prohibited airspace and modern airline operations. So the issues out there, uh, you've all seen the natural disasters that, that are, you know, they, we, we know about them through Twitter or through social media that uh, floods occur or a hurricane hits the coast or wildfires in, in uh, the, the North Woods. Uh, the regulators have to put up closed airspace and they have to do it rapidly. And usually we don't get an option or a vote in that. You could even be en route and that happens. And we're talking hundreds of miles of airspace that has to be closed in a rapidly quick time. So there's other issues out there with prohibited airspace. It includes VIP movement. Uh, it also includes uh, protected airspace that has been protected and we're gonna talk about it as well. Uh, especially the area here in uh, Washington, D.C. So uh, I'd like to kick it over to my co-moderator, Captain Wolfgang Koch, for some more good things about security and the risk of closing off airspace. Thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, joining us today. As Steve mentioned, my name is Captain Wolfgang Koch. I am the security chairman for ALPA, and I look forward to highlighting the security perspectives relating to the establishment of prohibited use uh, uh, airspace and the enforcement of the, um, the airspace once it is violated, both in Canada and the United States. The attacks on our country on September 11th truly dictate a reason why we designate prohibited use airspace. Further, what was witnessed following the, these attacks was a full shutdown of airspace that included all of the United States and Canada. Any non-military or other civilian aircraft that would have attempted flight <clears throat> during the airspace shutdown may have been met with severe disruption from military aircraft. This one-day event was the most disruptive event ever seen in aviation history as thousands of flights were diverted and mostly landed short of their destinations. Today we deal with prohibited use airspace for reasons of national security, protection of the presidential office, temporary flight hazards conditions such as wildfires, fires, hurricanes, and or other security related events. The consequence of flying into any one of these areas can be met with various penalties. Our objectives are to never fly or penetrate any of these areas but circumstances such as emergencies, situations sometimes dictate a different outcome. So today, we have brought together a panel of subject matter experts who can provide us with an in-depth look at what goes on behind the scenes in collaboration with many of our partners. When the, prohib when the prohibited airspace zones are established and how these areas are monitored and enforced. Please allow me to introduce uh, my two counterparts that uh, I dealt with and uh, that we deal with in the security realm. And uh, I have Craig, Craig Merrick, and Brian Townsend. And uh, we'll be happy to hear something from you guys regarding this topic. Brian, you want to start? Steve, do you want to introduce your two? Absolutely, will do. Uh, to my left is uh, Mr. Larry Lachance. Uh, Larry is the Vice President of Safety and Quality for 
uh, NAV Canada. Uh, in his role, Mr. Lachance is responsible for the NAV Canada Safety Management Program, which provides internal safety oversight of the management of operational risk as required by the Canadian Aviation Regulations. Larry is no stranger to this stage. He's been on numerous panels. Uh, he's an honorary ALPA member as far as I'm concerned. We, we should get you some wings. Uh, he is here so much, but he has worked with us on so many issues. He and his staff, Ray and Wayne, have been uh, uh, definitely available in, in working with us on all of our Canadian airspace issues, so I'd like to, to welcome you, Larry. Thank you. To Larry's left is Aubrey Farrar. Aubrey is the National Air Traffic Controllers Association facility representative for uh, Reagan National Airport Air Traffic Control Tower. Washington National. Sorry, did I just say Washington National? My apologies. We don't say Reagan. I, it's a soft spot with NAC. I apologize. <laughs> Let me make a note of that. Don't yeah. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate that. I'm very sorry, Aubrey, brother. Uh, my, my apologies. I hate to do that to our fellow union members. Um, prior to beginning his, year, his career with the uh, FAA in 2012, he pursued his pilot, private pilot's license to learn more about what he planned to control as a future air traffic controller. He's currently a controller and traffic management coordinator at DCA. So to round it out, Gentlemen, thank you for so much for being with us. Uh, really appreciate that and uh, for being here with us. And, and you know, to open up, as I gave the introduction and talked about some airspace closures and things that happen, um, you know, there's, a, there's an episode, Larry and I had a great conversation earlier about, uh, uh, you know, in the case of a natural disaster, such as a wildfire, uh, Alberta is, and right now it's peak season. Uh, there's fires happening now, but uh, in that situation, how does NAV Canada get the notification that we need to close airspace for operations involving water, uh, water delivery vehicles and uh, just general firefighting purposes or just to keep the public out? How, do, how does that ball get rolling and how do you disseminate that to airlines and crews? I, I think to start with, I think uh, I, just to contextualize from a NAV Canada perspective, uh, you know, we, we are uh, not connected from a regulatory perspective. So you have Transport Canada that regulate the airspace, and you have NAV Canada that manage the airspace. So in the event of, you know, situation like forest fire, uh, there's a very close coordination with uh, the regulatory body, with Transport Canada, because they're the authority that would issue uh, the, restrict, uh, the, uh, the restricted airspace, uh, the condition under which we can operate within uh, the, the different airspace. So basically when an event like that takes place, the first notification is to our regulatory body, but at the same time that this is happening, we have a mechanism in place to inform immediately uh, the operators operating in the area. And that's the job of the air traffic controller, to so make sure that first and foremost is inform the crew immediately take care of the, uh, the, the surroundings, uh, protect the area until the information is uh, readily available to be disseminated by the regulator through our, our, our company because we, they use our, 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 our means to communicate via NOTAMs or, or uh, you know, special events report and so on. So, so the, that's a small difference, I would say, from, uh, from uh, USA. But again, the solution in there is always linked to you know, immediate communication, uh, good coordination, and clear uh, role and responsibility, which you know, with experience uh, you've, we've gained over the years. So that's the way we do it. Very good. Do, do you get any input uh, from the airlines about uh, you know, if there's a large block of airspace? Do they provide you with, hey, you know, this, is a, this is a normal you know, traffic flow for our airport, and I have a hub there. I mean, do you get any of that input, or? Yeah, we do that through our national uh, ops center. Uh, so we do the coordination with the airlines, the operator in the area, and then and we get all that kind of input, and we uh, kind of act as a coordinating agency with the regulatory body to, you know, define the area. And and, and again, it's always in the sense of maintaining the service, but safety above all and making sure that the information is captured, uh, disseminated, and, and, and again, it goes back to timely dissemination. So, yeah, we try to balance the needs, uh, but again, safety trumps everything. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Aubrey, how about for you? When, when, when airspace closures come down from the, uh, from the, the, the flow in, in Washington, or in Warrington, what do they, you know, how, how do you get that airspace closure? How do you disseminate it? I mean, is it, 
how, do you, how does that process get rolling? All of that information is disseminated through the command center. Um, so for anyone who checks in and tries to find out what NOTAM is relevant to that airspace, uh, everything goes to the Washington Command Center located in Warrington, Virginia. Um, and they disseminate that information to their uh, radius of who needs to know. Okay, very good. And, and so there, there's a little bit of collaboration there, but it's, it's ultimately the decision of, of the command center to, yes. to do that. And as those who haven't been to the FAA Command Center, it's a large, large room uh, with a number of collaborators in the room. Uh, airlines uh, are there. Um, you know, it, it's, it's Air Force, D the Department of Defense, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a large operation, and they don't just make decisions. Whenever you hear that, that word, well, oh, flow control going into New York area, you know, it's coming from that building, but they, they, they bring a lot of data in, into that, uh, that room to make those decisions. So uh, definitely not in a, in a vacuum at all. So I'd like to kick it back over to Wolfgang to uh, talk about another issue that we've seen as far as airspace closures are concerned. Well. So it's interesting you're speaking of collaboration, and that's really one of the number one topics that we want to address here with my two partners. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, I believe it was, we saw two aircraft within about 15 minutes penetrate P-56. We live in a very complex, or underneath a very complex uh, airspace, and especially here within the, the Washington, D.C. area. And, of course, we have an airport, Washington, D.C.A., that's... Uh, has many operations hourly. And a little background from my end, uh, I used to fly the helicopter routes around here, and this is back in the mid 80s. So I got to see up close the operation until 9-11. And so at the beginning of the year, we started having a, a spike in penetrations to the, or incursions to the uh, prohibited airspace zone. And Brian here, uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about the, the work that you've done in collaboration with the unions, uh, the law, law enforcement, and FAA as to how we try to mitigate these, the, the threat. Sure, Wolfgang. And uh, to give a, a little bit of background and where we came from and, and how we got here today, uh, for those of you that over the years have, have flown out of Washington, you know um, obviously about the prohibited airspace. Uh, probably your own company has specific guidance to help avoid it. But years ago, for the most part, it was as simple as taking off and making almost an immediate left turn and avoiding that area and, and intercepting the 328 radial off the VOR. Uh, however, that airport still has noise abatement considerations. And even back then, uh, the requirement was to fly over the river and turn over the river and then intercept the radial. Uh, with today's aircraft, our high deck angles as we're climbing out, it's virtually impossible to maintain sight of the river. Along with uh, increased concerns from the, the folks that live um, around National Airport, uh, with regard to noise, it led to the desire to develop an RNAV departure procedure that would keep aircraft more over the water and less over the land. And, and of course, that, that all came together over a period of time. A procedure was developed. Uh, th initially, there were some operational issues with it, some of it from a technical nature. And uh, everyone sat down together worked out those problems uh, to the point to where we had a viable procedure that essentially worked for all operators that flew RNAV aircraft, in, including uh, the regional carriers. After all that work had been done, um, and we went through that implementation process, it wasn't until that the call that you mentioned, Wolfgang, earlier this year uh, with Craig Merrick on the phone that really highlighted the current issues, and that is that the incursions into P-56, primarily on, on departure, but also on arrivals, had been escalating at an alarming amount. And of course, Craig can, can speak to that as well. So um, we had a call, we had numerous operators on the phone, and uh, everyone said that they would um, you know, put bulletins out to their pilots. I know ALPA stepped up to the plate to make sure their membership was aware of it. And then, uh, as luck would have it, the 
following day after that call, I believe it was, there was another incursion. And that escalated the situation even more. Uh, at that point, and as basically being the lead operator out of Washington, American Airlines wanted to step up to the plate. We, we had been working very closely with APA. In fact, I think uh, John Deleuze here today, uh, some of our safety leadership from the union, and through our FOQA program, we had already been working on ways to add barriers and mitigations to reduce incursions. So the idea was to bring all the operators together at the table. It was a, a mandatory face-to-face -face meeting and to be very transparent about some of the recent incursions, but also what is each operator doing to prevent incursions within their own operation. And it was, it was very enlightening. Uh, everyone came very prepared, shared information. We found that some operators were doing a, a better job than others. And we exchanged that information and learned from it and had a, a number of recommendations that were made from that initial meeting that was, that was held in February and um, uh, agreed to meet a few months later to come back to the table and report on what everyone had done. And uh, on top of that, from the, the first meeting, we invited Craig in uh, with one of his associates to sit down and listen to what we had discussed and where we were going to go with this to show Secret Service and, and the FAA how we were going to reduce these incursions with, with the goal, of course, of, of making it zero. And um, it was very well received and also we agreed to establish a line of communications directly with Craig, which had, had not existed before. Uh, we provided him a list of points of contact from each airline, folks that were authorized to, uh, to talk to him and give some initial information when there is an incursion to help hopefully de-escalate the situation. And uh, I think overall that's proven very effective. Craig, I guess your, your perspective on that too would, yeah, would Brian, be good. So uh, to uh, just dovetail with what you're saying, so what we found is when we looked at all the data going back to when the new procedures out of DCA, hope I'm doing that right, uh, national uh, came into place, <laughs> um, we noticed that we were starting at about two violations a month, started rising to about three, and then when we hit our pinnacle, we were about five violations a month. Now, for most people, five violations a month is not too significant. You know, a lot of things could happen, right? But for the Secret Service, we're in a no-fail mission. Um, our previous director uh, happened to be an F-18 pilot, Marine. So you can imagine that the minute one plane violated, it was high on his uh, agenda. So who got the call? Me. Uh, we need to fix it. So. Uh, what we found is those two violations that occurred uh, roughly about 15 minutes apart turned out to be wind shear, uh, but that was not information we were able to get up front. And if we had not uh, engaged with uh, the entire community, and that's what uh, Alpa, Ali Frolik was, was a big lead on that one when I talked with him. I'd met him last summer. And then uh, Brian Townsend, we have worked with before, and of course our FAA counterparts. Uh, we came together, we decided during the government shutdown, because everybody at that time was very happy, uh, nobody was getting paid, but so we got on a telcon and uh, we discussed it. I found that most of the people, I think it was about 500 people on that telcon, that uh, a lot of people didn't understand how many violations were occurring and how much of a uh, concern it was for the Secret Service. Uh, to put in perspective, the only airspace in uh, at least this region, I can think uh, probably in the United States, it's owned by anybody other than the FAA, is the prohibited area P-56 Alpha and Bravo. So I guess as my director said a couple days ago, uh, we might have gotten the short end of the straw, but we actually own it. Uh, so Alpha and Bravo are the Secret Service airspace up to flight level, uh, just under flight level 180. So, yep. Uh, <laughs> so we own it and uh, it is our responsibility. Everybody here knows what's in there, the White House, the Naval Observatory, the Capitol, the um, Supreme Court, and the National Mall. So as part of our mission, we have to protect that. So uh, we found the wind shear issues really kind of highlighted because they happen about 15 minutes apart. 
uh, and there was no mechanism to get information. We get on the phone call with everybody and we're able to relay the Secret Service position of what's going on and what our concerns are. A lot of people came on that, uh, were on the telecon and said to us, well, we didn't know. Wow, that's good to know. And then as Brian said so eloquently, the next day uh, I refer to it as somebody decided to take a tour of the White House and was not cleared to go in. So unfortunately something happened and it was a very close call uh, of a violation, um, which then precipitated our February meeting, which uh, brought everybody in the same room together uh, and was able to speak candidly, uh, and in, including us, because everybody here knows us as, yes, we're a protection agency, but we are a law enforcement agency. But uh, I'd like to get this out on the table because I have a lot of people in here. Uh, I'm not here to prosecute anybody. We're here to fix the problem. We're here, this is a protection related issue. So the open line of communication is very important to us. And I think working together with the P56 mitigation team and all the representatives from the various airlines and their representation have opened up those line of communications. And I think we have identified some of the issues. We've corrected a lot of the issues. And now we're working with the FAA to put in a procedure that may reduce our violations anywhere even further down from 85 to 90% uh, below what we're seeing now. So again, it's all about collaboration and teamwork, and that's how we do our job. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's great. Um, and one of the important things that we recognized early on, at least, was first when these incursions uh, occurred, that even if we did submit an ASAP report, we were dealing with law enforcement because it's their airspace. And they don't need to abide by the uh, sanctuary from, from ASAP's reporting. And we had to collaborate and figure out a, a means of addressing what is a zero, zero fail mission for the Secret Service. But, uh, and I thank you for that, that, that uh, working group that you did put together. Steve, I'll hand it over to you for. Sure, absolutely. And, and when that first initial you know, conference took place, you know, I, I remember having the conversation with, with Craig and saying, you know, that, that pilot's intention that day was to fly from A to B, not to go through that airspace in a belly of an airplane climbing away from that airspace is something to consider, but you put it in perspective. You said, we're a zero failed mission. We cannot allow this to happen. This has to, we have to come up with mitigations to get away from it. And so uh, Wolfgang and I got together and got with our subject matter experts in the uh, air traffic group and, and participated in these phone calls. And you know, we, our eyes were open because yep. you know, what we did see in, in Craig was, was an openness to start sharing information and telling us uh, uh, you know, how he can get out and, and get the word out to uh, people. You know, we, we heard that noise was a complaint. So that's why they started moving airspace around. And Craig, what did you say? You told us, you said, I'll, I'll take the airspace, I'll take yeah, the noise so, our Yeah, Steve, so our, uh, our director pretty much wrote a letter and said, uh, Secret Service is our mission. We're gonna, you know, it's our job to jump in front of the bullet, right? So we're gonna jump in front of the bullet of this one. If people wanna yell and get upset about noise, then that's something we're gonna handle. Uh, but again, we're going to go with our protection-related mission. It's the most important for us. It's a no-fail. So, uh, you know, the, I write the letter, the director reviews it, signs it, blah, 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 and then I get to be the guy that they get to yell at, uh, which is fine. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, I think the great part about that is with the noise complaints, we're able to, when, when we did get together with everybody, we figured out uh, what we believe to be a good solution that actually even minimizes that. So I think with some of the plans that have been put in place and some of the proposals, that we're really not adding too much to, uh, to the noise. And I think that uh, what we found is the issues are actually a little bit further down. It's actually really not that close to DCA that the noise complaints are, are an issue. So, um, and, and again, I want to talk about the ASAP report since uh, I don't know how long we're each going to be able to talk, but um, we really encourage that. We think that from, our, from what I understood and how it was explained to me and, and the information that has been relayed, this is a, a fabulous program. Uh, and the Secret Service wants nothing to do with uh, taking away uh, that open line of communication and that ability to keep the, uh, the aircraft, the, uh, the flying public, and the airspace safe. And uh, so we definitely support that. Um, so we don't want that to go away. And I think that's why the open lines of communication, the ability to talk to representatives from the various uh, industries uh, and airlines who are talking with the pilots who may have just violated their prohibited area, we're able to un understand what happened. 
And I think the, the goal for us is, yes, we know it's going to happen. We need to find out why it's going to happen and why it's happening. And if we can de-escalate it, the quick, quicker the phone call comes to me, the quicker we de-escalate it. Because as it starts rising and becomes more uh, of, a, of an issue, uh, there's more and more reactions. So I don't know if anybody here knows this, but every time a violation occurs uh, in the prohibited area, uh, the enterprise, which is all the partners, react. And we can't constantly keep reacting because then you, what do you do? You get, you get complacent. And that's not what we're here for. We need to be on our toes. We need to be ready to go every time. So we definitely support the ASAP program. We want that to continue. Understand any information that your pilots are giving during that. We're not seeing your report. We are just getting information about be advised. This may be a safety of flight issue. I'll be quite honest. Nobody here is perfect. I think I shared with everybody here. My first ever lead on the detail. I failed to send paperwork to the big bosses. All right? I had to figure a way to do this while I'm on the road. I got the information to them, not in the right way, but I got it to them. Guess what? Never, ever missed it again. That was one of those check marks you do. We're all going to make mistakes. The question is, how can we rectify the situation? How can we mitigate it for future? And then also, really, how can we educate? Because really, this is all about education. Uh, you know, some people, I think, Brian, you said this at the, the meeting, some people were operating out of DCA this way, some were operating out of this way, some were this way. And when you have all the good people, the smart people, because remember, I, I don't know, my background here is I'm not a pilot nor an air traffic controller. So I talk the talk, but I don't walk the walk. Um, but the well, ability. I, I can speak to that a second. Because, <laughs> you know, I notice we have, um, uh, as far as the pilots here, we're all, we're all Airbus pilots, which that's great. But um, uh, Craig has one too. <laughs> we, um, with the adjustment to the procedure he's talking about, because it was a request by Secret Service to try to get the line a little farther away from P 56, because many of the incursions were what we called wing overs, where it just touch the boundary. Well, guess what? It counts. It, you still violated the airspace. And if moving that line a little bit even reduces that percentage, that's huge. Um, so there's a, a lot of support for that change. But again, with, with all of us together, and, and primarily my uh, fellow tech pilots from the other airlines, uh, met in Oklahoma City at the FAA's a simulator branch. They have a 737-800 and an Airbus sim there. Uh, we basically validated the changes to the procedure to make sure there were no unexpected issues. And fortunately, uh, we invited Craig and, and he came along and we made sure that we planted him um, in the Airbus, planted him in the seat, and he flew the departure uh, and hand flew it and did a very nice job and he's not even a pilot. So you're, you're sort of an honorary Airbus pilot. All right. All right. <laughs> to speak on a controller's perspective, uh, you guys know that DCA's operation is very complex in the airspace. It's very complex in itself. Um, for most of the pilots that fly in and out of DCA, um, everything's clear for an immediate takeoff. It feels like, but uh, uh, that's due to the limited real estate that we have. From the airspace perspective and the collaborative effort that's here, I think the best thing if you do uh, in, in, uh, encourage into P56 uh, is to communicate to the controller and let them know, uh, and let them know so we can de-escalate and help the Secret Service de-escalate with their security apparatus. Um, as controllers, we, we see the left wing turn, contact Potomac departure. Uh, even if you're not talking to us, just contact, uh, let the next controller know um, because in air traffic as anything or becoming a pilot uh, um, in your checklist. If you're having a um, mechanical issue and you're troubleshooting your FMS or whatever you guys are doing, fly the airplane, avoid safety first, avoid P50, P56 and fly the airplane and then let the controller know uh, that you're troubleshooting your FMS or you're having something, uh, an issue with your airplane or whatever the issue is, just communicate that to us or Potomac and we will disseminate that information uh, to the next level so it, it won't be any problem when you land. That, that really is a, a key point that Aubrey brings up and in our, our second meeting in April uh, was discussed, uh, the importance of that immediate information. And, and again, to, to emphasize, if, if you have a wind shear event, maybe encountered some wake turbulence, uh, any type of 
um, operational issue with the FMS, those types of things, if, if you can let that controller know, that's very important information to pass along. And, and we fully realize that there are instances where uh, the crew didn't realize that they had penetrated P-56, so obviously they're not going to say anything. But uh, if, you know, if you can, at, at your, your own carriers, make sure that that information is out to the pilots about that piece of communication. Let me ask Larry a question. So does, when the prime minister makes a move, is there protected bubble or airspace around him, or is it no tam closed the airspace? How does that operate up in Canada? Yeah. Before I answer the question, I, I, I would be remiss not to mention earlier, I forgot to indicate, you know, in the dissemination of critical safety information, we have our flight service specialists as well that play a key role because they're always proactive uh, and not reactive as a controller would be in, in transferring some of that information. So I just want to make sure, because I forgot to mention that, and I think it's very important in the information as well. As far as the, the, our, our prime minister, we don't have the same uh, requirement. Uh, the prime minister is more on a priority basis. Uh, the, the, the bubble around the prime minister aircraft is the same for the en route separation that we would provide. Uh, but that being said, it, it is being monitored continuously by NORAD. Uh, we're doing some kind of monitoring as well. And if we see any unusual events taking place or any indication, uh, we're the first one to uh, notify uh, NORAD of, of our observation. But there's no uh, restriction per se around the, the prime minister's uh, aircraft, uh, only priorities and lane when, you know, landing and departures. Okay, yeah. great. So that's a, that's a great point, which, uh, you know, brings me to the next topic. So we're not just talking about P-56, Alpha and Bravo. There's also VIP movement that, Craig, you have to handle. And maybe you can give us some insight on that, just when those VIPs move, what, what, what activities you have to do, and how do you notify uh, airlines and dispatchers and NOTAMs and the FAA on when those movements happen and how they do it. Well, Steve, I appreciate that. This is, this is a great forum for us because we're coming up to uh, campaign uh, 2020. So uh, everybody's really excited about that, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I get about three hours sleep a night, so that's going to go down. Uh, so you can expect, uh, if you looked at anything, if you want to look at trending, if you took a look at the midterms, you saw what the previous president and vice president did, right? The current president and vice president, what they would do is they'd go do about two or three stops a day. A couple of them may have been on an airport. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul is probably the perfect one because uh, they put the site right in the middle of the airport. Uh, and so you're going to see that. They like to travel. It's a face-to-face -face environment. So what does that mean for you? We all know that commercial aviation is approved to operate inside of a temporary flight restriction for both POTUS and VPOTUS. Give you the little insight. The VPOTUS TFR, VIP TFR, is three nautical miles, 3,000 feet. It's pretty much an ADIS, very minimal restriction. The POTUS TFR is a 10 nautical mile flight restricted zone and a 30 mile air defense identification zone. Just one anomaly that might come out, you may see a larger uh, 10, 11, or 12 foot flight restricted zone and a little bit larger on the air defense identification zone. It's done to ensure that we're not putting up two 10s and two 30s and taking up half the eastern seaboard. So we design it to make it easier flight, specifically for your general aviation flyers, but it, will adver it could adversely affect you because if you're going into the airport, it's something to know. Couple things. When NOTAMs are published, we try to get them out at least 72 hours in advance. Um, so make sure, and we have talked with a lot of the operations groups, make sure they're checking the NOTAMs. It's going to be the indication that you're going to have a presidential or a vice presidential visit at an airport. There are security procedures that are put in place at those airports uh, that have to occur. If we have multiple runways at an airport, uh, the design for my team is to find out which, airport, which runway uh, Air Force One or Air Force Two are going to operate on and try to keep the other air, uh, runway operational. There is one codicil to that. You will never parallel Air Force One or Air Force Two in, and you will never parallel them out. So the president and the vice president is not going to look out the window and go, wow, look at that plane. There it was. It's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, so we, we try to do what we can, because it's a balancing of the safety and security that we have to put in place for protection of the president and the vice president. 
uh, and sometimes other protectees such as the Pope. Uh, but it's also allowing that commerce to continue. A couple other tidbits. The reason we want you to check your NOTAMs is instead of going with the minor fuel loads, you may want to consider about having just a little extra fuel, and I understand I'm not trying to get into the money side of it, but there is a good possibility you may have to hold for a little bit until those security procedures are complete and the president or the vice president are on ground. That being said, when you run up onto the point where you feel like you're looking at the dials there and you may have to make that decision to divert, it's all about communication. If you are communicating with uh, center, let them know that you have only a few more minutes before you have to make that decision. If you're uh, contacting approach, the same thing. Communicate, communicate, communicate. If you let them know what's going on and there's a possible for a di divert, we have a plan to get you in. Okay? I will tell you this. Don't do it all the time. Don't do it when you, because, you know, every once in a while somebody will go out there and actually take a look and say, did you have enough fuel? Did you not have enough fuel? But what we're looking for is we're looking to be straight up with you and be fair to uh, the, the pilots out there, understanding that we want to get you safely on the ground uh, and we don't want you diverting because we know, one, how much of a pain that is, and two, how much money that costs, and three, how many phone calls I get. So <laughs> not necessarily in that order. Um, so we do want that. The other thing is, again, is most important for us, it doesn't matter whether we have the president on the ground or we have the vice president on the ground or they're on final. If you have an emergency, declare the emergency and we will do what we need to do. If we have to send Air Force One or Air Force Two around or we have to delay their departure, we will do that. Safety is the most important thing that we have here. We understand what you do. We understand the positions you're in. But again, it's communication and safety. So I always like to say that. And please, if you can, pass that to, your, to the pilots, the people that you, your friends, anybody who, who operates. And since you're all commercial pilots and you're in that level, any of your friends who are the general aviation side of the house, please have them check their notams. Because I can tell you every single time we do have to do an interview, it's 98% tell me they didn't check their notam, and 2% blame Garmin. So, <laughs> really what we're looking for is information, education is absolutely the most important thing to do. And uh, we're here to provide that to you. And again, we want to work with you. We absolutely do. We understand what you're doing up there. We have our mission, but there is a balance that we can, we can make work. So, so um, I, I pick up on that point about uh, communicating and the fact that the, the two aircraft that were 15 minutes apart that had penetrated the P-56 area, they went into wind shear. And again, that was not communicated. You know, it's, um, it's one of our requirements, right? If we have uh, on takeoff and we're experiencing a wind shear event, we need to report. So very important that we get that out. But also, I'd, I'd like to address, uh, I think there's, uh, there's a certain apprehension for the pilots, uh, knowing if they've gone into the P-56 area and or other temporary flight restrictions in, in Canada. I was wondering if you could sort of highlight what, at least here in the Washington airspace system, what, what do we expect? And then maybe in Canada, what, what, what can we expect? So I think uh, the first, the first process is if you did violate the P-56, Aubrey, if I'm correct, you'll, you'll, somebody will come up over the radio and inform you to call a, uh, should be Potomac? Yeah, probably get a phone call and, and we'll have to give that, we'll issue the brasher. Exactly. The brasher. We'll have to uh, give there a number is. to call, uh, whether that's Potomac or Washington State, I don't know. Uh, it, it depends on what the Secret Service wants us to do. So that call is just your initial call informing you that you did violate the prohibited area. If we're talking about DC, um, it's a little different. You, you guys normally on the commercial side don't deal with this um, uh, on the temporary flight restrictions, but it, it could happen if you go Nordo. Um, please don't do that. Uh, I'm going to say, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, that's a whole other reaction. Uh, and the gray and the black fighters don't really enjoy doing that. So. On that side, so the brasher is the first indication that something may have happened, you may have violated. Uh, so you're going to get the contact. What we have been able to do, and actually if it wasn't for the partnership and the working relationship that we've developed, 
Uh, there was a procedure in place that anybody who violated the prohibited area on takeoff or on landing in DC would be met by a Secret Service agent or two at their destination and would henceforth uh, adversely affect their day because it'd be a long interview and there would be a lot of concern about what happened. So what we've been able to do, and trust me, that was an option on the table that my director threw out. So, uh, but we were able to bring that back, work together with our partners, and try to figure out how we could reduce the violations. Uh, right now, we are at an interview that could occur uh, to a pilot, a crew, would be is you, if you were egregiously violate the P-56. Well, that would be running up 17th Street, taking the tour of the White House, without communicating anything to anybody, meaning safety of flight, wind shear, uh, FMS issue, wh whatever could have happened, uh, and no attempt to deviate that route. And again, if you look at it from our perspective, that's like a truck coming right at your, po your post. If you're coming right at us, you're coming right at our, our site, you know, things don't necessarily act, react well when things like that happen, because again, you're no-fail mission. So that is what we look at for the interview, and I've been able to tamper that down. But that is, there is always that possibility, and just remember, the Secret Service reserves that right as part of our protective mission to do the interview. But because everybody has been working together and the lines of communications are open, and trust me, when my phone rings, the next phone go out, Ali, yeah, I know he's at the to leave, but God, his phone is like ringing. He's like, please don't tell me it's another violation. I can't even call him just to talk to him, uh, just because he's like, please don't. We have like a code, like that, you know, the, the shoe is red and we're good. So he's, he's totally fine. Um, but just understand, like you said, communication is the utmost importance. Safety of flight is the utmost importance. Get control of that aircraft. Fly it. Keep the people safe. Communicate. So, but the brasher and the communication to the FAA, I will also tell you this, do not discard that. If you were told to call Potomac, if you were told to call Washington Center, if you were told to call an air traffic control, call them. Because if not, then you probably will be met. It may not be at the airport, it may be at your house. Uh, so we don't want to do that. Make sure you do it, because we will treat that as you're trying to evade and we don't want that we want communication so open line of communication yeah, to, to piggyback on that in that case uh, where there were two violations within 15 minutes or uh, 18 minutes or wherever it may be um, sometimes when you fly in and, and out of DCA the it's, it's multiple variables on why the configuration may be north or south for that day an example I believe that we had a, a south wind uh, however we were in a north configuration uh, due to visibility low visibility and every, every time we move the airport around, it's, it's all contingent on uh, what approach is operationally advantageous for the pilot to make to get as many flights as we can in. Um, so sometimes when you come in and out of DCA, you may have an extreme tailwind uh, d due to the configuration. And, and that low level wind shear, that's things that we know, and that's something we can communicate as well uh, to mitigate uh, before it escalates to um, you know, whatever you guys do. So. Thank you. Larry, you want to tell us about what goes up in Canada there? Yeah, well, in the case of Canada, I mean, you know, it depends on the regime you're flying in uh, uh, with, either IFR or VFR. If it's IFR, uh, if you breach a protected zone of the restricted area, uh, then our role is to report that to the regulator, regulatory body. And they're the one taking over after that. If you're a VFR, you can fly right on the edge of that uh, restricted zone uh, but if you penetrate, then we report. So basically our role is really a, a reporting agency of the breach and the enforcement activities are being taken by the uh, regulator, which is Transport Canada. Great. Steve? So this is, this is just a, a general question. So if, if a temporary flight restriction gets posted here in the United States of uh, presidential movement or you know, that presidential bubble you spoke of, Craig, Who's responsible ultimately to make sure that I stay out of that airspace? If I am on an IFR flight plan, I, I look towards Aubrey on that. Is it air traffic control's responsibility? Is it my certificate operator, meaning the airline? Is it my responsibility? Is it all of us? Who is ultimately responsible to make sure that we know that that notum is there and we're supposed to abide by it? Well, I put the onus on not just the controller, but as long as the operator is the pilot as well. 
Um, we have to do our due diligence and, and seek the information and see what exactly is going on. We do a pre-weather briefing. There's things that we do prior to our shift. And as a checklist, as a pilot, there's things that I believe that we expect uh, to, for you guys to do in, in return. Um, now, flying in and out of DC, you always know there's some type of restriction going on. Um, but I, think I do put the responsibility on you and, and us to know as well. So no one's confused or, uh, when, when a violation does occur. So, so pilot's fault, got it. Well, okay. yeah, I, um. I think and I'm in a room full of pilots, and I'll be quite <laughs> honest with you guys. Uh, Notums and, and uh, checking in with the 80s is very important. Um, and it's not because we want to make sure you have information out. It's because the FAA, and we want to make sure that every, every segment and every pi rep is disseminated to you. So whenever you take your right of flight, then, I, then we know for sure that we're on the same page. And, and you know what weather you may hit uh, or what weather you may be rerouted around from a traffic management perspective. So I don't blame the pilot. I think that we, we both share responsibility. Uh, but I do want to make sure that the information that you, uh, it's, it's not just for the pilot, it's for the passengers as well. Uh, and I appreciate that, Aubrey. And I, 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 it was a rhetorical question overall. We are responsible ultimately as the pilot in command of the aircraft to be clear of that airspace. So uh, a great discussion with your dispatcher if you have a dispatcher available. I know we have some supplemental carriers inside of ALPA that don't uh, deal directly with a dispatcher, but getting that information uh, in your flight deck and, and as part of your planning is important. Larry? Yeah, yeah in, in our case, it, it, it's quite interesting, actually, because in the majority of the case uh, where we have restricted area, we can display these on our ATM system, and we have a functionality within the ATM system that will prompt an alert if you're going towards or you're about to penetrate. So it, it's almost like we have the, all the tools to help you uh, in, in avoiding the airspace, and when we don't, uh, depending on the condition, it could be full onus on the air traffic controller, this, this, depending on the investigation uh, result, or uh, conclude that it was a pilot uh, error. So it's uh, interesting because, because we, we have the tools, we take some of the accountability on our side as well. Definitely. I, you know, the, I, the scenario comes to my mind, so I'm one of those, those airplanes that takes off and takes the unauthorized White House tour and I land at uh, my destination, what can I expect from the Secret Service uh, after I've received that brasher alert? I mean, what, what type of reception? Am I gonna be hauled out in cuffs? Am I gonna be questioned? Am I gonna have to call, phone a friend? What, what's gonna have to happen, Craig? <laughs> um, so, I, I can say this. So, you're not gonna be hauled out in cuffs. I can tell you that. Uh, I can tell you that there is a procedure in place that if you do take the White House tour and you have not been on the guest list, uh, that uh, you will be met by, most likely you'll be met by law enforcement when you land. Um, they will allow the passengers to disembark. And the reason I say you're met by law enforcement because then you're gonna be met by a couple secret service agents who probably just got home from a long day and now just got called out to have to go out to the airport to interview pilots who violated the prohibited area and they have no idea what the prohibited area is. Uh, so they're gonna read you about 13 pages worth of questions and they're gonna answer and you're gonna answer them all and then I have to then decipher what happened. Uh, but long and short of it is that's, that's really what happens is you're met by two agents. I think my understanding is after the conversation occurred with unfortunately one of the, uh, actually the only one we had to do recently the interviews was, it, it was very, it's always very professional. Secret Service are gonna be very professional. It's not, av uh, it's not adversarial. It's about just getting the information, but it does take time. We have to assess whether the pilots did it uh, as an accident, did they do it as part of a probing, uh, did they do it on purpose? Uh, and that's something that takes a little bit of time and that revolves a lot of questions. Uh, so. Highly recommend don't violate the prohibited area. Definitely don't take the tour of the White House. 17th Street is really not that nice. I can tell you that. Uh, I can see with our new procedural changes, and I would say even before procedural changes, all the work that people have been doing recently uh, to paying attention, getting, you know, uh, knowing your situational awareness, understanding the conditions, flying the aircraft the appropriate way, stay out of P-56, 
Um, and then we'll try to put in some procedures down the line uh, to maybe even help you out a little bit more to give you a little bit more of a buffer. And then uh, we just keep going, keep rolling. But again, it's, it's really attention to detail. And Brian, well, yeah. you know, one of, the, one of the big takeaways from everything you're saying, and, and by the way, the, the fact that we have this communication and relationship with Craig is, is huge for the pilots out there. You, you have no idea. Um, it, it does take a lot of the pressure off of pilots potentially refusing to fly the, the RNAV procedure out of national and the impact that that would have on air traffic. We've, we've heard that so many times from the controllers. And, um, but yet at the same time, uh, none of us want the threat of losing our certificate or time on the beach without pay, all these considerations. So the, the big takeaway is I think just about all the operators have tools in place for you to use when you're flying out of that airport. Make sure you apply them, follow the guidance. But probably most important, because things can happen, uh, after you depart, and if for some reason it doesn't look right, the automation's not working correctly, um, whatever the case may be, you do not have time to talk about it or push buttons and, and try to get back on course. You have to turn the autopilot off, make an immediate left turn, avoid P-56, and then figure it out after that. Well, I would say communicate to air traffic and let us know what exactly is going on. And the reason why, uh, whether it's troubleshooting, I think quick, concise, and honest communication from a pilot to the controller will help mitigate this process and we can look at actually lessening the uh, P-56 incursions uh, through just by communication and collaboration, so. But I'm not gonna talk to you until I get out of Dodge. Well, boy, you know, you know. <laughs> Contact with Tommy DePauch. <laughs> <laughs> there you well, go. I'll tell you what, uh, this, is, this is a great example of the collaboration and working with the different agencies and groups, whether it be uh, an Alpha airline or an outside airline or a federal agency or a, a, a navigation services provider. Uh, we have those connections and we have these discussions and you can tell by the primary people here on this panel today the type of relationship that we have that we can, you know, pass a few jokes around. But it's all serious work and, uh, you know, I, I definitely want to look towards Brian and Craig for their work on the P-56 work. I think we wouldn't be where we're at without their leadership and candor on, on the subject. Um, with that, Wolfgang, if you'd like, maybe we will open it up for some questions. I have one if we don't have one. I just want to ask Craig, or I want to ask what's really on the roof of the White House. Can you, <laughs> you talk about that or? Yeah, that's. Uh, no, can't, yeah. can't touch that one. So I have to look outside for questions. Is there anyone that has any questions for this group today? Don't be bashful. There's only one of us with a gun. We have a text question. No one? And he's Someone on our side. Text yes, he's on our side. We, we do text have uh, text questions, yes, um, if I could take a moment. I think it's great that both of the uh, civil servants on the stage worked through the partial government shutdown without yes. complaint, and it's yeah. just uh, awesome for their service. Yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of the questions was uh, about the change in the number of violations after these, this focus and this uh, kind of outreach to the pilot community. Is there any updated statistics from the last couple of months? Yeah, we're, we're doing very well. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so la did. Last time that was said by uh, a good friend of mine at the FAA, not, not Aubrey, so uh, he's a good friend, but not, uh, not his section, uh, because air traffic control doesn't do that. Somebody in security did. And then we had two violations. So uh, we are doing much better. Uh, and I think the attention to detail, uh, the procedural uh, things that are, are out there, the, the notification, I know that Alpa and all the different airlines are sending out. Alpa is definitely a big one because I know Ali send it, <laughs> CCs me every time it's sent out to somebody. But it's, it's, it's good information. So we are down, uh, significantly down. If we can stay on this trend, uh, I can get a little bit more sleep. So all good. And that, and that bulletin that's referenced is available, and we sent that out in about uh, middle of February was yep. when we sent that out. And it was, it was very unique because it was a joint safety security bulletin, which is unique for our organization because, as you can see, there are the safety ramifications and security side. So Wolfgang and I, 
in, in conjunction with staff and our legal department, put together a guideline of what, to hap what, what could happen and what you need to do as an MEC. So if you do get that phone call from a crew member that says, you know, I just found out that I just went through uh, uh, some protected airspace, uh, you have that tool available to you and you also can phone a friend. We're always willing to help and uh, get you through it and uh, we stand by ready to assist. Any other questions? We've got one. We do have more, yes. Other text? Uh, and it didn't come up yet, Steve, and I know you had a bit of trivia with the, uh, the Waypoint, Papa, Lima, Victor, India, Alpha. But uh, then the broader question is what's being done to moving maps on today's airliners to make it easier for pilots to visually see proximity to these airspace areas? Ashley, Brian, 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 you've got. Well, part, you know, you referenced the, uh, the waypoint, and that was one of the mitigations we put out. I, I know with uh, American Airlines, we had a waypoint that we called White House, and um, the pilots had put a mile ring around that to use as a, you know, for situational awareness, the, the critical southwest edge of P-56 to help avoid that. And uh, during our discussions, several of the operators that weren't aware of that were, were very curious, and many of them don't tailor their databases, so the FAA stepped up to the plate and essentially made it a public waypoint. Now, it's not actually published on, on a nav chart, but um, uh, all the operators have the coordinates, and, um, and it is in the national database, so any pilot uh, can pull it up, and if they have the capability to draw the ring around it, uh, then you can use that for situational awareness. But even with that, and I, you know, everyone that's a pilot in here will understand that on our moving maps, we really don't have that level of detail uh, to precisely highlight exactly where that airspace is. So in, in terms of on the flight deck, I'm, you know, currently not aware of any additional tools that would help us in, in that regard. I know with, with iPads now and some of the other tools out there, and I think even more so on the general aviation side of the house, uh, they do have increased situational awareness on uh, TFRs and prohibited airspace and, and so on. So if anyone else has any more information than I have on that, speak up. As far as the violation, if we see anything, I mean, we don't have the technology and we're, we're progressing towards technology, but if we see a, your wing turn, looks good, and you know, but that's, that's from the controller perspective. Um, from the Secret Service perspective, and it, it, we may differ on that, uh, but I would say that things are moving a progressive way. We've got time for one more question from Captain Nick Seymour. Nick Seymour from Jazz Aviation. Um, as you know, <clears throat> as a Canadian carrier, we fly into uh, the airport quite often. And uh, what I'm wondering is if you can briefly perhaps entertain some discussion on what happens when an, a foreign pilot, a, can a Canadian pilot, has a departure violation and ends up landing in Montreal or Toronto. How would the Secret Service and others follow up if he didn't properly respond to the air traffic controller and do all the right things Good in question. flight? Now you're in a Good question. bad situation. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. That's a great question. I, I get a trip to Canada. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, I think... Uh, I'm uh, trying to think, I'm looking at the, at least trying to go through the database in my head, I don't think we've had one. But if we do, we actually have an office in Ottawa. So uh, I guess a couple agents up there. Probably not a couple. We only have a couple there. Probably one uh, <laughs> would get tasked out with doing that. Um, but uh, if you guys can do us a favor, uh, just keep it clean, and then we don't have to do that. <laughs> but if it's a nice time of the year, I really don't mind coming up to Canada. So uh, I can call you guys and let you guys know. But yeah, I think that's, I mean, ultimately, uh, we have offices. You know, of course, we have all in the United States, but we have, we're around, around the world. So if somebody were to violate, now, P-56 is, is pretty much, you know, Canada, United States, so it's not really that big of, it, uh, of an issue. But we do have offices around, and if we needed to, it was determined it was that egregious of a violation. Remember. The interview process is egregious violation. So our goal is to reduce the wing-ins, eliminate the wing-ins, and really keep it down to the manageable number, which maybe half of that, three quarters, if not more, 90-something percent, can really be attributed to 
a, uh, I don't want to say safety of flight, but something that we, we, could, uh, we could actually, um, you know, we could handle, uh, you know, tactically, uh, locally, without having to do an interview of, of a pilot. That, that's probably our last resort of interviewing, uh, interviewing pilots, but that's, uh, so just keep it clean and we're good to go. Check remarks. No, that's good. Good question. Well, yeah. that'll wrap up our panel. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Everyone, let's please give them a round of applause for their being here with us.